automate any application or do advanced web scraping with Microsoft Power Automate Desktop. This course contains 10 lessons about how to use the RPA tool from Microsoft. If things goes too fast, just rewind or pause the video. It's designed for that. I expect you to have Microsoft Power Automate Desktop installed. If you haven't done that, simply just follow the guide up here and come back to this video. Now open up Power Automate Desktop. The first lesson is about variables. Here you will have the variables that we'll use the most. The first one that is text. That could be any kind of text from email addresses to the content of a Word file. So for example, let me move to my desktop here. I have an empty folder called project. This is where my entire project later on will go in Excel files, documents, everything. Let's grab the path of this. So I say shift right click, then I can find this copy as path here. I need to press shift in while I right click with the mouse. Otherwise, this will not get shown. I click here and I go back here. Now I create a variable that will store this project path. So I'll find a set variable like this and drag it in here. These blue things, those are just comments I made to help you so you can actually uh, see how we differentiate the different kinds of variables. First off, we need to give the variable a name. The default name is new var. And look what happened when I press here. You can see that we have percentage signs in the start and in the end. That's the sign of a variable. So whenever we want to refer to this variable, we not only need to type in the name, but we also need a percentage sign in the start and in the end. So new var that is not re really describing for what we're doing. So we always want to rename our variables. So it describes what we want to do with them. For example, this one will be project path. And now I didn't leave the per percentage sign and wrote a project path. And when I click away, they disappear. But when I click back, you can see them again. Power Automate Desktop automatically made these percentage sign because let me delete everything and I just say project path again, go back and these will automatically be made. So now I can refer to this variable by its name. I can use it later on in flows. So if I go down here to value, press control V, delete the two quotation marks like this. Now I can refer to this project folder in my entire process. That is very clever and is the best practice that we often use because these paths can change. I can move the project folder and then I just need to change the value of this variable for once. Imagine that I will use it like five times uh, during the flow. I can only I can just use it here and then just refer to this variable name. So that is very easy to understand. This is also the most common ones we will use text a lot. Then we'll have a numerical. Those are numbers. And when we want to do mathematically operations, then we want to use a number. A number looks like this. We will initialize it with another set variable. So if I drag this one in here, let's say that this should symbolize the VAT. So if I say I can say VAT like this and again, click back, you can see we automatically get these percentage signs. So you don't need to write them. Then we'll give it a value. In Denmark, it's 0 0.25. And then I can click Save. So now we have a VAT. Let's uh, do a calculation. And here I want to introduce a an action called display message. If I drag this one in here, then uh, there's a lot of parameters to fill in. I will just fill in the message to display. A display message action is exactly what it is. It will display a message to the user and the robot will pause until the user has clicked. OK, let me show you. So, For example, here we can say the price of the uh, product is 122 plus that. So the that will just be a text here because I haven't used these percentage signs in the start and in the end. So those one will just be letters. Let me show you. So when I click save here, I can now click run. You'll see that 
Here it says the price of the product is 122 plus that. But we actually wanted to uh, do a calculation. We want to add these 25% to it. And we can do this. So when I go uh, inside the display message, I can double click to edit it. And now if I want to do a calculation, then I need to have percentage signs in the start and the end, also around the numbers. So it will look like this. So it says 122 plus VAT. But when we have uh, the VAT was 0 0.25. So we just need to say, and let me just say a parenthesis. Then I want to say 1 plus VAT and then the parentheses end. Because then this will be 1.25. And then I want to, instead of the addition, I will have a uh, multiply 122. We'll find a total pr price, including VAT. It's worth to mention that I only need percent signs in the start and in the end when I'm calculating something with a variable. So I'm using the variable here and you can see we don't have percent signs uh, here and here, but we have them here and here. So only in the start and the end uh, on the entire expression. So now I can click save and we can try to run the robot. So here you can say now the price of the product is 152.5. That is, we now made the entire calculation. I can click OK. Then let's move on. So because we don't want the, this display message to show up in during the rest of these, uh, this exercise, I will right click here. And then you can see disable action. It's, it gets grayed out. You won't see it. So we don't have this uh, little bit annoyed, annoying uh, pop up um, in front when the robot runs. Now let's move to a Boolean. A Boolean can only hold two values. It can either hold true or false. That's it. We use it a lot when we want to do checks. Let me show you. Again, we will initialize a Boolean variable. So I'll find a set variable. Then I drag it down here. Let's say that I want to find out whether or not this is a rainy day. So this is a fact. I will say amount of rain. This could come from a website or anywhere else where we have weather forecasts. So the amount of rain, let's say it's uh, five millimeters today. I'm not sure if that is a lot. I don't think that's a whole lot, but it's still rain. So now we set it and I can initialize another variable called rainy day. So this one will be called rainy day. And this will have the value false. So this is a Boolean I'm introducing here. So I'll say true or false. You'll see it in a second. Now, if I run this, these will just be set and nothing will really happen. But we can actually uh, do something about it. Let's say I want to change the, the rainy day value down here. So I move in here. And let's say I want to make it uh, dependent of the amount of rain. So here I'll say if it is a rainy day, that is if this one up here is above 15. So here I will say amount of rain. And again, I could uh, write these things out. But the great way to refer to these things up here is to click this X here and then I'll say amount of rain. Now it comes in automatically. I don't risk uh, of typing wrong things in. So now I have the amount of rain. Again, when we make a, an expression, we just need to have a quotation, uh, sorry, percent signs in the start and in the end. So I move in here and I can make spaces in here that uh, that will just be ignored. It will be a little bit easier for you to look at. But then I will say if the amount of rain is uh, bigger than 15, we said. And so this what happens here is this will evaluate on this value. So if this amount of rain is larger than 15, then this will be true. Otherwise, it will be false. Let me just do this. Let me run the robot again. Nothing really happens, but we can see it over here if we want to inspect our variables. So this is a nice place to be. You might not see it and uh, it will look like this. You just have to click this X up here. Now I can inspect the variables and their values for the last run of the robot. If I click in here, you can see we have a Boolean value called rainy day and it's false. And that makes a lot of sense 
because we we said that um, we want to evaluate if the amount of rain was larger than 15, then we wanted it to be true. But now it's only five, so it's definitely not true. But we can try to change the value up here. So I'll say 20. And I run the robot again. And now you'll see the rainy day Boolean variable. I can double click it over here. Is now true. So um, these are checks that we want to do often. So Booleans cannot be ignored. Um, and just remember, they can only be true or false. So they are quite easy to understand. Now let's move on. Um, a date, uh, a date time uh, in Power Automate for desktop comes in a standard format, and that is month forward slash days forward slash uh, years hours minutes seconds. Let me show you. So if I find a get current date and time like this, and I drag it in here. So here I want to say I want to get the current date and time. And I want to output it into the current date and time variable. So we haven't uh, talked about variables produced, but each of these uh, flow um, actions over here to the left, they almost all of them produce a variable. This one will just give us the current date and time. So when I click save, you can see our action down here. And if I run it, you'll see over here to the right, if I double click here, you can see that this is the current date and time. That is the 5th of October 2022, one, 10 minutes uh, past one. And we can even have um, some seconds on. So this is the default. But we can actually, what, what lies behind here, we can also get milliseconds and everything on. We can do a lot of conversions. So if I just do this, and we will use date and time a lot. Imagine that we want to create a log or we want to dynamically name files so they get a timestamp on whenever we receive them or whenever they get created, we will use a date time. But we might not use want to use, let me again open it, this format because this looks weird and we cannot use all these colons and forward slashes in when we want to do timestamps on a file. So we want to convert it. And what we can do here is that we can go up to actions and then find a convert date time to text and drag this in here. So here you'll say date time to convert. I want to choose the current date and time. So I click this little X here and I take current date and time. The format to use, well, we can use standard. And here you can pick uh, between a lot of formats. So for example, I can pick long time. This only give, gives me the time and it will save it to a variable called formatted date and time. I can click save. Let's try to run the flow again. And again, the values only exist for in the memory of the robot. We haven't printed anything out. And that's really that's not really the point of this lesson. But let me move uh, inside. Uh, first of all, we have the Q and date and time. Uh, this one, the Q and date time, this will look exactly like before, except that it's now a little bit later. And the formatted date time, if I double click here, now you can see that this is a text value and we only have the time here. Similarly, if we wanted other types of output, if we wanted to use this time date time, we can uh, we can use uh, in the convert date time to text, we can just pick another one from, for example, short date, we can pick a full date time that looks like the with the date in a text format like Tuesday, or we can actually do custom say I want to use it in a file format, I'll often go with this, the year first, then the month, the days, the hours, the minutes and the seconds. So this will be a nice timestamp because this will be unique down to the second. You can also get millisecond, but that's not really the point here. Let me just click cancel and just stay with long time. We will not use that anymore. So lists and list a list is a collection of items. That is, for example, a list of text values, a list of numeric values, booleans, etc. Let's create a list of um, text values that could be animals. We can, um, we can set a list in a lot of ways. We can either do it manually with a set variable, or we can actually, if I go up to here to variables, we can see that we have a lot of um, list actions here. We can create a new list. And then we can add items to it. 
Usually, uh, we will not go with these actions, uh, and we will just create them with a set variable that is easy, easier and more flexible. With this add item to list, I can only add one item to the list at once, but I often want to add like five items, 10 items at once. I don't really want to drag five of them in. So it's very, very easy. So I'll find a set variable here, and now we will make a list. Let's just call this list animals. And then to initialize a list variable that will I'll need to have percentage signs in the start and in the end. And then I just need to have a hard bracket in the start and in the end. And then my list items will go inside these hard brackets. And these needs to be comma separated. For example, um, I want a, a cat and these ones text values needs to be in single quotation marks. So that will look like this. If I didn't have these single quotation marks on, uh, Power Automate for a desktop will think that this cat would be a, a variable because it is inside these percentage sign and then we'll have an error because we haven't defined the cat variable. So remember these single quotation marks. Then just list, let us just pick a dog, comma separated bird like this. So this is how we initialize a list. And you can see I have uh, spaces in here doesn't matter. These will just be ignored, but it might be easier for you to read when you watch this video. If I click save here, I now have a list. Let me just run it again. Um, we have a lot of things that goes on during runtime and then not do anything else. But that's the point of this lesson. We want to see how we can work with variables. If I go over to animals and double click this, you can see that this actually got initialized as a list of text values. We have three items. We have cat, we have dog and bird. Each one of them, they will have um, an index number. And in programming, uh, most of the things are zero indexed. So that means that the cat is uh, placed at index zero and one and two. You just get to, uh, to get just get to have your head used to it, that the first item is not index one, but index zero, and then you'll be fine. We'll use it a lot, so better remember it. So the first item in a collection in programming is zero. So let's say that we want to refer to the dog in this list. That will be index one. So and let's just have a, another display message here and drag it in. So um, if I just uh, drag this, um, this display message in, I can uh, in here, I can say animals. So uh, the first one thing I want to do is to refer to the animals. And then I wanted the dog, which was at index one. So I just go uh, say hard brackets. And then uh, I will have the one I can click save. So now um, I will run it again. And uh, here you can see I got a dog out and I clicked OK. Similarly, if I move in here and I change this one to two, we will have the bird printed out like this. So here we have the bird. So now let's just try to uh, iterate through each one of the values because that is often what we want to do. We have a list and we want to process each, each item in that list. We'll do that with a for each and we'll come to what a for each is. So for now, it's just an iteration of a collection. So here I'll say, what value do I need to iterate? Click this little X here and say animals. We will store it into Q and item. This is just a reference value. So whenever I refer to uh, the Q and item, that is, uh, we run this loop over and over as long as we have items in the list. And wherever we are, that could be we are at the cat, that will be the Q and item, the dog, then will be the Q and item, and then the bird. So, and I often want to rename this to make it uh, a bit of reference so I can say what's going on. And this will actually be a single animal. So the list that is animals and each of these items that is an, an animal, so I can click save. Now let me drag this uh, display message up here. And instead of uh, animals uh, too, I'll just refer to the single animal. So I double click this and here I can just delete here and then I'll refer to the animal. I'll click save. Let me try to run it again. So here you can see I have my cat, I have my dog, and I have my bird. That's it. That's how easy it is 
to use list variables. So uh, again, I'll just right click this display message and just disable the action. So we don't have this pop up going when we move on. So uh, the next thing we want, that is a data table. I haven't made a description for data table here because this data table variable is very, very important. And I want to play close, want you to play close attention because we will use it a lot. So let's make the comment together and it will look like the other blue ones, but I just want uh, you to pay very close extent, attention. Sorry, that was a, a, a terrible word to say as a non English speaking. So we have a data table and a data table uh, looks and acts uh, like an Excel sheet, except it only exists uh, during runtime. And when I say runtime, that is when the robot runs. So whenever we start the robot and the data table can initialize till the robot has, has uh, ran, uh, that is where uh, a data table exists. A data table has several key advantages. It's very fast to work in, faster than an Excel sheet. So that's why we want to use it. So it only exists during runtime. And again, it's zero index. It's zero indexed. And uh, again, if you want to refer to the first row in a data table, that will be index zero. Otherwise, no difference. And um, a data table is actually a list of data rows. So and let me just uh, tell you what's going on here. So when we say it, it looks and acts like an Excel sheet, that is, we have columns and we have rows. We usually just read our Excel sheet into data tables. We look at the exact same things, except that they only exist when the robot runs. But we'll do that so we can easily do uh, gymnastics with the data. So now that we have the definition in place, we can create a data table. So go up here, we can do it in several ways. And here we can also use a set variable, but I actually like the create new data table action. So drag it in here. So here I can say uh, how many rows and columns do I want? Well, I want three uh, rows and two columns. We already have two columns. And let us just say uh, we want to call this. So I right click here, I can either delete, clear or select. And when I double click, I can rename it. So I want to call this name. And this one, I will want to call it age. And I can just start by um, giving it values here. So say that I want this to be Abraham, and Abraham is 20 years old. I now want another row. So I click this little plus here and I actually want two more rows. So let's just create two of them. Then I want Becky. Becky is 41 years old. And finally, I have Carlo. Carlo is 65 years old. So this is my data table with data. And of course, I could have read this from Excel sheet. Now I just created manually. So then I can click Save. Here you can see we produce a, a variable called data tail. Again, let's give, an, uh, let's give it a more describing name. So I'll call this employees and then click Save. So now we created a data table called employees. Again, we can refer to uh, I, uh, to any of the elements in here. And the way we refer to data tables, here we have three, three rows and two columns. That is, that we refer to the data table name. Then we say what row we want to, to look in. And then we will say what column we want to look in. Remember again, it's zero indexed. So for example, if we wanted to get Carlos age out or the age that stands here, then we will have to say um, employees, and then we will say two, 2.1. That is the coordinates of this one here. Let me show you how that looks. So I just click save here. Then I'll find a display message here and just write it out. So here I want to look in the employees data table. I'll find it by clicking this little X here, say employees and go in here. So here I'll say we wanted to have the second row that is the third row, but it's indexed uh, second two, And then I want the second column that is index one, I'll do this. So this is what I'm saying here, look in the employees data table and then take the second row, first column, let me get the content of that cell that was 65 if I remember correctly. 
Now, if I run the robot again, you'll see that we get uh, 65 out. That was our mission, mission complete. Similarly, we could also uh, iterate through a data table. That is, in fact, it, well, it could also be an Excel sheet that we read into a data table. So again, I'll find a for each. Let me drag it in after the create new data table. So the value to iterate, that will be employees. And here again, I have this little reference variable. I will just call this employee and then click save. So now I can refer to this employee. Let us just use this display message again. So I'll drag it up here. And we just need to fix the expression because now I want to refer to employee. That is the first one. So if I just do employee like this and I could actually delete it, go find it over here so I don't misspell and then I can click save. So when I run this, you'll see that we are uh, saying we get the whole data row out. And that comes back to what we said in the beginning, a data table is a list of data rows. So this is one data row, Abraham 28. The next one comes here and the third one comes here. So, but what we want, let's say we just want their, their age out. So uh, I can go in here and then I can say employee and then I need to refer to the column header or index. So for example, if I just do hard brackets and I can say H and do like this and I can click save. Let's run the robot again and um, they will come out here. So that is the first H, the second one and the third one. It's that easy. So that was data table. The final thing that is custom objects. A custom object that is key value pairs. That is, we have a key and then we have a value to that. Think currencies. Um, if we want uh, the key, that will be USD, for example, that will be US dollars. So the key is USD and then the rate that will be in Danish kronos that will be 750 maybe. So that will be the value. And that has the advantage that we can look things up in a custom object. I can say, give me the USD. I will say, give me the, the value of the key USD and then Power Automate for desktop will give me the value back. It looks like this. And it's also had the advantage that it's easy to convert to a JSON, if you know that. That's very advanced. We will not touch it here. So I'll find a set variable like this and then I'll drag it in. So we're down here in custom object. I'll call this currency. So then we'll give it a value. So this is the name currency and uh, again, percentage sign in the start and in the end. This time to create a custom object, I need curly brackets. So I'll do this and then I'll have it in here. I'll again, I'll need this to be key value pairs and USD that will go in in single quotation marks in a colon and then its rate. So 761 times 63. Let's uh, give it that. That was our our first uh, key value pair of currency. Then I can have a comma separate. I can create as many key value pairs as, as I want. Let's just create like three. So I'll say euro colon and then I'll have the euro rate. So uh, 700 and again, these will not be the correct rate, but something similar. And then I will have the Indian rupees. And actually, if you're wondering what base currency it is, it is Danish kronos. I'm from Denmark. So um, then I'll have this colon. And again, I'll have the currency rate here. That will be 9.31 and like this. So now I created this custom object. I can click save. It's down here. And again, let me just disable and I'll actually disable this for each so we don't have the iteration and I'll do it up here as well. So we only focus on the custom object. Now we created it. Uh, when we run it, you will see that it exists during runtime. We can go over here, find the currency. You can see we have this custom object and we have the three key value pairs. But uh, say that we want to uh, find uh, whatever the US dollar rate is. So uh, let's have another display message here. So when I want to do a lookup in a custom object, it's very simple. I just go down here, message to display. I'll say currency. Then I just need to give the key and that will be in hard brackets like this, single quotation marks. I want to find um, the currency rate of US dollar. I click save. 
Then I can click run. So that one is 761.63. We can see that is right. So then I can click OK. So now we got that one. But let's say we want to do a calculation. Let's uh, finish here. So um, here I want to say, uh, let me give this a message. So I'll want to say one US dollar because this was 100, um, 100, uh, Dan sorry, 100 US dollars cost uh, 700, uh, 100 Danish kroners cost 600, uh, 100 US dollars cost 661 uh, Danish kroners. So let's find out how much one US dollar cost. You can probably do it uh, very easily, but let's see how we can do a calculation. And I'll just say one US dollar and divided uh, this expression by 100. I can say one US dollar is and do like this. So let us just uh, start the robot again. Here you, go, here you go. One US dollars is 7.6163 Danish kroners. We could, of course, uh, write that as well. We just uh, move uh, outside the expression and put in DKK and then click run. That's it. I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Anders Jensen, a full time RPA teacher. You're more than welcome to follow or connect with me on LinkedIn. The next lesson is about the recorder in Power Automate desktop. Key to boost your Power Automate learnings. You'll find the recorder by just clicking the recorder up here. And say that we want to find out how my company, Anas Jensen Org, is doing based on Google reviews. So what we want to do first is to open up a browser. And we'll do it by clicking these three dots here. Launch new web browser and then I'll take Chrome. That will open up a Chrome browser. And you can see here that we open up a blank page. So this is the first step. Then I can say record and start recording my actions. But be aware, it will record every step with your mouse and keyboard. For example, if I just do this, you can see that it moves the window to a new position. If I make some actions that don't really make sense, I can either reset it, that will reset the entire flow, or simply click this little delete icon here, that will delete this action. So now I want to navigate to Google. So I'll just say google.com and press enter. Power Automate Desktop automatically says, well, we are launching the new Chrome and then we'll navigate to this in one actions. So it compressed my say three or four actions into one. That was quite clever. Now I want to do a search and that is in this search box. You can see it turns red. So when I go down here and then make a search of Anas Jensen org, you'll see that this is the recording. Uh, this is the reviews page. These are the data that we want to scrape over here. We want to get how many stars the company has and how many reviews. We only have two, but it looks good uh, so far. And if you want to review the company, you're very welcome. So um, here you can see we have we actually have two steps. We have a populate text field that was the Anna Jensen org. You can see it here, and then the press form that was probably the enter click. So now we need to get the data. Let's start with the average rating, which at this time is five point zero. So what I will do is to navigate over here to this span. So it only the red border should only sur surround the reviews. Then I'll right click, extract element value, and take the text. You can see the text right now is 5.0, but it will work uh, no matter what the, the average rating is. So now you can see we stored this. We also need to store uh, to, uh, to store the sample size. Right now it's two, so it's really small. But nevertheless, move over here. Here we cannot get the two out or uh, isolated, so we need to say two Google reviews. Let me get it again. Right click, extract element value the text to Google reviews and drag that one out. Here you can see we got it in in a variable called output data. That is a data table I'll show you in a little. Now we have what we need. And if I click done here, you can see we have some auto generated actions that is launching a new Chrome, navigate to Google, do a search for Anders Jensen org, click enter, that was this one, and extract the data. Let us just close down this page and let's run the automation to see that it works. So we are launching Chrome, we're doing the Google search and we extract into data. 
Right now, we will only extract it to a data table, but let me show you how it looks. So if I go over here into output data and I double click this, you can see we actually have the data web scraped here. We have a data table of two columns and one row. If I wanted to get the, the average rating out, then I'll need to refer to this output data. And then I'll say I want a 0, 0.0. A data table is zero indexed. That means that the first row you can even see it here is named zero. The first column is also indexed zero. So that'll be 0, 0.0. And uh, to Google reviews, if I want to, to say how big is the sample size, it's two here. Then I want to say 0, 0.1. Let's uh, combine these auto-generated recorder steps with some manual actions so we can present the data. Again, we will have a display message. So find a display message and drag it in. Message to display. Well, I want to say based on, and now I'll say how many reviews do we have? We have two right now, but it could change when you watch the video. Click the X here and take the output data. And again, let us just uh, repeat what we wanted to do. We wanted to get uh, how many reviews we have. And that was, we only have one row. So that was the zero indexed row. So zero point, and then it was the second column. So 0 0.1. We'll do that by saying hard brackets zero, and then another hard bracket start, one hard bracket end. So this one will give us the um, the value of the data table called output data and whatever we have in the, the first row, the second column, it's zero indexed again. So then we'll say based on two, three Google reviews, whatever that is, the average stars is, and then we just want to say we want the 0, 0.0 because that's where we have the stars. So shouldn't we just so we are lazy. We want to automate things and not make errors. So we just copy this one, control V, paste it in, and simply just change this one to a zero. So now we can present the data. And then we just close the browser again. We can uh, make our robot do that, but let's just stick here in this recorder lesson. So this shows you the power of the recorder. You will automate, you have automatically created these steps. And now we're combining it with manual steps. It's great for learning purposes. You might not use the recorder in say two months from now, but in the beginning, go use it, learn as much as you can from it because you will learn these actions very well because they are auto generated. And here you can see we have based on two Google reviews, the average stars is 5.0. That's right, I can click okay, the robot finished. Let's also say that we want to use a variable in this auto generated flow. So instead of Anas Jensen org, I might want to change this based on some input in another system. So here I'll find a set variable here and I'll drag this one in. So here the variable, I will give it a name so I can refer to it. I'll call it page. And let's say I just want to search for Noma is a restaurant here in Copenhagen. I'll give it the value here. I can click save. Now I want to use this variable inside where I do the Google search. So if I double click here, I delete this Anas Jensen org, click this X here and find the page. So now I do a search based on whatever this value holds. Imagine that we can change this based on previous actions. Right now it's hard coded in as a say as a hard coded in as a set variable. We could also have a list. So we want to get the reviews of say like 10 pages, then we can store it in a list and iterate through it with it for each. Now it's just a one. So but if I click here, you'll now see that I search for Noma. And then in a little while, I will say based on 1646 Google reviews, the average stars is 4.6. So that's it. Did you like the recorder? Now we are moving further into Power Automate Desktop and look at some advanced logic. So let's create a variable with a value, then evaluate on that value with an if and a switch and let our flow take different path. So go up in actions and then find a set variable and drag it in. We want to evaluate whether or not it is a rainy day. And imagine this variable, the value of it comes from another system, for example, a forecast service. 
So here I'll say expected amount of rain, and then let's give it the value five. Before we want uh, to call it a rainy day, we need to have more than 15 of expected amount of rain. You can see it as millimeters. So then I can click save. Let's create that condition with an if. So it looks like this. I'll find an if. And if always asks a question that can be answered true or false. So let's evaluate on this expected amount of rain variable. So I click this little X here, expected amount of rain and double click. I want to say if this is greater than or equal to 15, then I want to do something. So this will be the true, otherwise it will be false. Per default, everything that comes in between the if and end, that will be if this expression is true. A little bit later, we will make the other branch that is if this is false. So if this is true, that means it is a rainy day. So let's find a hey, display message and drag it in here inside the if. Here I will just say it's a rainy day like this. I can click save. Before I run it, can you tell me whether or not this display message will get shown? I'll click here. And no, it will not get shown because this expression says we only want to run whatever's in here if this value expected amount of rain is larger than or equal to 15. And it's really not. But we also want to tell, uh, not right now it says it's a rainy day, but we also want to tell if it's not a rainy day. And we can do that very easy. So find an else and drag an else in uh, below or uh, down here. So now we created these two branches in our if. So if this is true, everything from the if and down to the else will get performed. And if it's not true, everything from else and end will get performed. Let's just do another display message. And we're lazy as automation developers. So mark this one with a single mouse click, control C, move your mouse down to end, click here once, control V that will paste in the action the correct place. Now I can open it. And here I'll just say it's not a rainy day and I can click save. So let's try to run it. And um, here you'll say it is a, it is not a rainy day. That's what we wanted. And we can click uh, OK. Now let's change it up here to maybe 15 because now it will be a rainy day. So now when I run this, it will say it is a rainy day. I click OK. That's it. So now we created an if that asks a question and it will take two different directions. So it will take the, either a true direction, everything up here, or a false direction down here. And when these actions are performed, it will jump to the end and then take the actions that will come down below. Right now, we will not have any further actions. But what if we wanted to have three outcomes with an if we can only have two, either true or false, then we can introduce a switch. So and let me just um, click this little if up here, press shift in and click the end, right click and disable actions. Now these ones here will get ignored, not the set variable. So and a switch can be seen as an if on steroids. And uh, the way we introduce it here is that we'll say switch and drag it in here. So the value to check that will still be the expected amount of rain like this. So here you can see we have the switch and then we have the end. Now we need to define, so nothing will really happen right now. We need to define some cases and a case look like this. So up here in actions, I'll find a case and drag it inside the switch. So the first case is that if this expected amount of rain, that's the base that we are evaluating on, if that is equal to zero, then we want to do something. So case zero. We also want to have a case whenever uh, the expected amount of rain is larger than or equal to 15. We are not doing anything yet, but let's just create the cases first. So here we want to say if the expected amount of rain is greater than or equal to 15, then we also want to do something. We also want to do something whenever the expected amount of rain is between 0 and 15. That is our third case. We couldn't create that with an if, but we can do it now. 
And now an important concept comes in, but let us just first create the case. So here I will just say, if this is greater than zero, then we want to do something. And here you might say, well, we look at the expected amount of rain. Then if it's zero, fine, we'll perform the actions that will come in here. We'll see that in a little while. But, and then we'll go to the end. But uh, let's say that it's uh, above zero, then the actions will be performed here. And this will actually, um, a switch will perform the case that comes the first. That means that say, um, um, this one here uh, will actually be um, larger than zero, then uh, this one will not be performed because it will take this one first, say, say it's 16, then this one will be true, it performs this, and then it will not perform this. So what we need to do is to move it up here. Then let's just have some display messages and then let's test our flow. So with, uh, with this equals to zero, that means it's not a rainy day like this. And with 15, we want to have it a rainy day. So I'll say it's a rainy day. Very easy. And then this zero. We change the order of it because the, the, they will pe be performed uh, only one of them. And so if it was like 16, then uh, these both of these two could actually be seen as true. But we want to, um, to make it here. That's why we have it uh, first before the larger than zero. So and then it is uh, a slightly rainy day. That is if it's between zero and 15 like this. So now we have our three conditions and let's just test it uh, from the start. Let's say zero. So if it's zero, then it will not be a rainy day. That's fine. We go into the correct case and we click OK. It's done. Now let's change this to, for example, 10. Then it will be a slightly rainy day. Let's see if uh, that actually is true as well. Yes. And now let's change it to 16 to see that we have the order of the cases correct in the correct sequence. So I'll say 16. And now you'll see it will say it's a rainy day and finish. That's it. That's how easy it is to work with condition if and switches. Do you have any questions? Please let me know here in the comments. The next lesson is about loops. First of all, we have a for each. A for each iterates through, say, a list or data table. That's the most common ones. So let's create a list that we can iterate through with a for each. I'll find a set variable and let's give our list a name. I'll just call this animals and then let's create the list. To create a list, you will have two percentage signs in the start and in the end hard brackets done in the end, and then we will have the list items inside these hard brackets. In single quotation mark, put in your first element, that will be dog. And then I will say cat, and let's have a bird like this. So three elements in our list that we can iterate through, and I can click save. Here comes our for each. So I'll drag in a for each, what value do I want to iterate? I want to iterate to the animals up here. So I'll say animals. I'll store them into a Q and item variable. That means that now we have three. So and we are looping through them one by one. So that means whenever we are in the first occurrence, we can refer to that item as Q and item. Here it will be dog. Then the next iteration takes place. The Q and item will now be cat, bird, and so forth if we have more elements. So let's storm into an animal variable instead. And here you can see, so the list is called animals. And then each item, when we loop through with a for each, that is called animal. This is just a reference name. You can call it whatever you want. But best practice is to use a name with some meaning to the data. In that way, it will get later. It will get easier later on if you want to update your flow or if your colleague wants to. So then I can click save. Now let's just print out the names. So very, very simple, but I'll find a display message as we often use when we want to display messages. So here I can just refer to this animal here. So I click this little X, the animal, make sure you pick the animal and not the animals. But then I can click save. I click run, dog, cat, 
squared. That's how easy it is to use a for each. Now we want to use a loop. So, and let me click um, this for each up here. Hold shift in, click the end, right click, disable action. It's just because I find it annoying when we move to the next example to show these pop-ups. So, but you can find have them if you want. So let's have a loop and the loop is doing something X times. Let me show you. So let's drag in a loop. And here you can see I actually accidentally dragged it in uh, before the end. I'll just have it here. So I want to start from one. I want to end at five with increments of one. So this loops run five times. One, two, three, four, five. Very easy. It produces a variable called loop index, and that is an index of what loop we add. So first it will be one, two, three, four, five. Very straightforward. Then I can click save. Again, let's try to display a message here. And here I'll just write out the loop index. So click this little X here, take the loop index, and we could say this is run number like this, a space, and then we'll have the loop index. So now when I run the loop, it says this is run number one, two, three, four, five. That is a straightforward loop. Often we are using its cousin called loop condition. So let me again mark all these things and disable this. So now I want to um, do the loop condition and a loop condition evaluates on something. And whenever this is true, the loop will continue. We'll often use it when we want to check for elements at the web page, say that we want to pause the flow um, and then look for an element. If the, that element is not present, then we want to pause it further and maybe pause it for like uh, 10 uh, or 20 loop iterations of maybe 10 delayed seconds. So we can use it to check for something and then make it last a while. Let me show you. So here I'll have a loop condition and I'll drag it in. Actually, I dragged it in before the end. It will go in after, but let me show you. We can uh, move it afterward. So the first operand. Now we need to, to have an operand. And since we don't really have it here, we can say, uh, we can say if two equals two, save. And let me just move this end up here. So this is essentially an infinite loop. This is always true. So if I run the robot here, you'll see that I have now created an infinite loop. It will run forever because this condition is always true. So, and this is not really best practice. As you can see, this run, this robot will run forever. But imagine that it takes some uh, hard system actions right now. It's just running. It will not take uh, any system resources but you can actually create a very bad robot that will run forever. So always uh, do your conditions uh, so they can change or make a handbrake. I'll show you both of the things. First, it's just um, instead of here, we will have something to evaluate on. So I'll find a display um, input dialog. Here I will take, I'll ask the user for some input and then I'll save it as a variable. I will drag it in in the loop uh, condition here. So here I want to say uh, the title that could be capital. And here I'll make a little quiz. What's the capital of Denmark? And then uh, the user will give me an input. So that will be stored here in user input. Let us call that capital for easier reference. Then I can click save. Now I only want this loop to run uh, until the user has the, the, uh, that the capital value is Copenhagen, because that's the correct answer. So if I go up here in loop condition and then say the first operand, let us just say capital. If that is equal to Copenhagen like this, then uh, it will run. So right now uh, we just need to change the operator to say not equal to. So now it will run as long as this capital variable is not Copenhagen. Let me show you. So, and let me just drag it in over here. So what's the capital of Denmark? I'll say London. It will run once more. Let me just do one more fail. So Rome, come in here and let's just pick Copenhagen. It's now finished. 
So it finished because um, this one was not true anymore. So the capital is not Copenhagen, it's not equal to Copenhagen, then this will run. But now it became Copenhagen, so this became true, and it stopped. So a loop will evaluate on something when it goes in, run the actions inside it, evaluate again, and continue. But what is what if if our user was very uh, didn't know the capital of Denmark? Then we created an infinite loop that could essentially run uh, unlimited times. I know that the user will probably get bored after five attempts and then just leave the computer or shut the flow down. But imagine that this was some unattended robot that checks for something. Then we wanted to to have some sort of a break in the loop condition, and this is very important. And for this, I need some sort of a counter that says only run this loop x times. So I'll find a set variable here, and then I'll drag it in here. So here, this one, I will call this loop index, and it will start at one. I only want to run it 10 times. So I also need to each time a loop has run, I also need to add one to this. So pick a set variable uh, in the end of the loop. And this is actually something that you'll use a lot. So please pay close attention. So the value, click this X here, I'll add one to the loop index whenever we reach the end of the loop. So that will be plus one here. I don't want to make it 10 because then I need to make 10 guesses. So let's just make it five to make it easier for ourselves. But you can, of course, change it up here in the loop condition. So right now we can only do um, we can only do one condition, but we can actually make uh, more conditions inside here. We just need to make it a little bit different. So what we can do up here is that we can say if uh, the capital is not equal to and then it's Copenhagen like this. And now you just need to have it in um, single uh, quotation marks because uh, the capital is a variable. Copenhagen is not. That's just text. So that's why. And then we also need, so we know we need to have an and, and then we can say if this loop index, we only want uh, if the loop index is is um, is less than or equal to uh, five, then we want it to run. When the loop index is six, that means that the loop had ran five times. We don't want to run it anymore. So that's it's just um, below six, and we can write it like this. So if the loop index is less than six. Then, so we only want this to run whenever the capital is not equal to Copenhagen and loop index is six. So this is an expression, and now we will change it to equal to true. So we will only run run this loop condition as long as this expression up here is true. That is, if the capital is not correct guessed and the loop index is below six. Let us see. So now we can run it. And um, I'll just show you here, and I need to drag it in here. So now the loop index is one, you can see it over here. Let us just press A. Now the loop index is two, I'll just press B. Uh, not correct answers, so C. And that's why I didn't want to make it a D. And now it'll be the last one, because the loop index is five. This is still true, but next time it'll be six. This will not be true, so we will stop our loop. I don't know where I went that, so that'll be E. There you go. We have now made a backdoor. This is a very important concept. So if you didn't know what, if you didn't understand what what went um, on here with the set two set variables and the condition, please rewind the video and do it. Excel is the most used business application across companies, and here's how to automate it. So I created a Excel book here on my desktop, and I open it, and there's only one sheet in it. Here I have five columns three rows and one header row. So the first one that is a good, tablet, TV, laptop, B that is revenue, C that is cost for that good, and then we want to calculate the profit. The profit is simply just the revenue minus the cost, and then we want to write a status such as processed. A very simple task, but it shows you all the nice features about automating Excel in Power Automate for desktop. So let's go do it. So I close my Excel book here. You will find that automating Excel in Power Automate for desktop can cause some problems and I'll also show you how to solve them. So stick to the end. First, I grab the path of this Excel book. I press shift in, right click, copy as path. Then let's move over to Power Automate for desktop. The first thing we want to do is to find a launch Excel. 
drag it in. This launches an Excel instance that we can use. Here we can choose to open a blank document or a following document, which could be our Excel book on the desktop. Sometimes you want to create a log from scratch, then you choose blank. Otherwise, we want to open something. Here I can either browse to it by clicking here, or I can simply just control V pasting in my copied path. So if I delete these two quotation marks, that's it. That's the path. Make instance visible. That's nice in the beginning when you want to see what's going on when the robot runs. But honestly, it's not necessarily and it hurts performance a bit. So close that on tick that. So now and then we have open as read only if we don't want to edit the data in it, which we want here, then we can tick open as read only. That will increase performance a bit. But for now, we need to edit it. So we'll untick that as well. Then click save. Generally speaking, I don't like to hard code in values. That is this path here. Imagine that this changes. I need to go into this action, change it here. That might not be the problem. But imagine that we have used this path four times in our flow, then I need to update it four times. So best practice is to create a variable for path. So up in actions, find a set variable and drag it in above the launch Excel. This one here, I could call this Excel path like this. And the value that will be this path again here. So I just control V and delete the quotation marks. Now creating a variable has the advantage that I can now just refer to the Excel path and then get this value out. So if I click save here, and then go into launch Excel, I delete this document path, then I can click this little X here, Excel path, double click it or click and then select like this. Now it got chosen here. So then I can click save. So now we created a dynamic a variable that we can easily change up here. So now we launch it. Usually, uh, we want to um, make sure that we also close it again, because that can cause a lot of problems in Excel, I will show you a little bit later. So again, stick to the end. So here I take a close Excel in. And what I want to do is that I want before I am closing Excel, I want to save it. So and here, uh, you can argue that we want to create a new document if we wanted to create uh, different logs. So say that this robot runs every day, we might uh, need a new book for each of those runs, then we just take save document as and choose a document path with the dynamic expression. For now, I will just say save document that will just override what's ever in it. But we will not delete any data, we will just update the empty columns. Now we can start reading from this Excel sheet. So these were just the, the skeleton that we built. Now we can put on some meat. So here I want a read from Excel worksheet, drag it in just in the middle of the launch and close Excel. So here I need to say what do I want to read, I could read a single cell, I could read a range of cells. I can take a selection that is if I work in the UI, like opening Excel physically, we will not do that. I'll tr we will try to refrain from that. Or we can just take all available values from the worksheet. That's the one we'll pick. We will read everything that's in this sheet up here. And we can go in advanced. And here you can see first line of range contain column names. We have column names, headers. So that one we will take that one. You can see that we're reading this data into a variable called Excel data. This is a data table. A data table is a very important variable type in Power Automate desktop, as we'll often use it when we want to manipulate especially Excel. A data table looks exactly like an Excel sheet, except it is zero indexed, and it only exists during the runtime that is when the robot runs. So when we read it, we read it here, then the robot stops somewhere down here, then uh, the this data table will not be accessible anymore. So if we want to save something in it right now, we just read it. But if we want to update it, we need to remember to save this data table into the Excel sheet. So let's try to click run. So we are launching Excel, then we're reading from it, and we're closing it. 
if I go over here to the right to variables. In case you don't see it, it looks like this or it's empty. Just click this little uh, X up here. These are the variables that we have created. The Excel path we created ourselves, and these two got created while the flow ran. Open the Excel data by hovering your mouse over three rows, five columns, and double clicking. That is our data table. And it looks exactly like the Excel sheet, except you can see here the first row is called zero, then one and two. And actually, um, this first row in the Excel was column two because the headers was actually all was actually row number one. So you just need to, to say that in the data table we have a headers um, headers row that, that doesn't have a name. And then the first row is zero index, so that is zero. Just need to get your head around that and you'll be fine. Don't worry, it will come to you after you made your first couple of robots. Now we want to update um, these two here. So we have uh, the difficult one that is profit. Here we need to make a calculation based on whatever's in here, 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 and then the status. So when we processed these um, rows here, I want to write processed in status. Let's go create that first. That's the easy part. And then let's pick the difficult part um, afterwards. We need to say in this data table, I need to iterate through each row one by one, and then I can update profit and processed one by one. So here I'll find a for each and I'll drag it in right after the read from Excel worksheet. The value to iterate. Here I want to iterate the data table. So click this little X here, double click the Excel data. So that's the one I'm going through. I'm now storing uh, each, uh, the iteration uh, takes the row one by one. And each time the iteration takes the row, I can refer to that by saying current item. I um, often want to create my variables so it reflects the data that's in it. That's also best practice. So here I might say goods and then click enter. Don't worry about these percentage sign. That's the sign of a variable in Power Automate for Desktop. And Power Automate for Desktop automatically creates it when we create when we just write here in a variable field. You can see it already did it for me as well. So then I can click save. So now I'm iterating to it. I need to do something about it. And we want to write to our Excel sheet. So I'll find a write to Excel worksheet here. And then I drag it in. So now we just need to think about what do we want to write? Well, um, we want to write processed like this. We want to say, I want to write on the specified cell. So which column do we want to write in? And here, let me just click save. This will give us a few errors. If I just open it up again, the column that we want to write in, that's column E, you can see it here. So let me close it again open it up, go into write to Excel worksheet and take the column. Now we need to fill in the row. And this is the row that we are in. And uh, since there's no uh, way we can we can do it if we pick this little X up here, and we can see the goods, there's no uh, thing that we can get the row number, we can only get the columns count the column names. So what we will do here is that you'll create a supporting variable. That's an important concept in Excel automation. So just go outside it again, find a set variable. And this set variable it will correspond to um, the row numbers in Excel. So here I'm saying set variable, and then uh, I will call this Excel row counter like this, and we will give it the start value too. And that's because we're writing back to it, the Excel worksheet. And here the first row was in row two. Let me just show you that as well. So we are completely sure that we are aligned. So this is the first row we are updating it. And that's because the first row here, that is the headers. So here I want to say, I want to uh, update this one first. Then I want to add one to that counter each time that for each runs through our data table. So we know that we are aligned with this Excel sheet. It looks like this. So I go back here. I have this variable. Uh, I gave it the value two. That corresponds to the column. Uh, row, sorry, to the row number. Then I find another set variable. Drag it in in the end of the for each. Here I will add one to this counter. So click this X here. 
say Excel row counter, go into the value, Excel row counter, and to add 100, you need to go inside the percentage sign and say plus one like this. So now we have a counter that we can use up here in the right to Excel worksheet. Go in here, say row, click this little X here, Excel row counter, and click save. Shouldn't we try to um, actually see that this works? Remember to save your flows in Power Automate for desktop because there's no auto save here and you might uh, restart your computer without uh, noticing that you had a flow here, then it will be lost. So now we are running. Uh, we can see that we are launching, reading, set the variable, iterating through the three rows, and closing Excel. We only had the process now, but let's just see that that worked. Then we can easily do the conversion. That's it. We processed uh, three rows here and we wrote in the status. Now we just need to calculate the profit. The profit here uh, that is calculated where I want to say revenue minus cost. So it will be 4,000 here, 2,000 here and 10,000 here. Um, it looks like numbers. And even though if we formatted those as numbers, um, they will still, when they come into Power Automate Desktop, they will still be treated as objects or text values. So we need to do a conversion. So we get them from here and then we convert them to a... Um, to a, to a number so we can do a calculation. And here, um, just do this and go back here. So in our data table, I want to say for each one of the rows, I want to say the revenue that should be stored into a number variable called revenue and the cost, whatever it's in here, will be stored into a cost variable numeric value. So I'll need to find two convert text to numbers like this. So here, convert text to numbers. And uh, we will do it before the processed. So drag it in here. So which text do I need to convert? I will look in the Q and item, which we named goods. So click this little X here, take the goods. Now I just need to specify in which column do I want to look? Well, the first one we'll take, that was the revenue. So say hard bracket start, hard bracket end, single quotation mark and a single quotation marks. It might be a little bit difficult to see, but it's uh, it says goods and then hard brackets, two single quotation marks, and we'll start writing inside the two quotation single quotation marks. Then I just say revenue. So this will take for each one of these goods row, it will convert whatever is in the revenue column, it will convert that to a number. It's called text as number. Again, we want to rename our variables. That's best practice. So here I'll say revenue like this, and then I can click save. So now we have converted uh, the revenue. Then we also needed the cost. We can do two things. We can uh, either drag one more in here, or I can say control C, control V. Now I have two similar. I just need to update this revenue to a cost. So I double click it, I say cost instead of this, and the variables produced, that will be cost. So now for each one of these rows, when I'm iterating through it, I have two values now, revenue and cost, I can write back to my Excel worksheet. So um, here I'll say write to Excel worksheet, and the value to write, well, I will just um, say revenue, I'll move it over here, revenue minus cost. And to do that, I'll need, uh, first I can get the revenue, find it over here, like this. And when I want to subtract two variables, um, I need to only have percentage signs in the start and in the end. So it will look like this. I can have spaces in, it doesn't matter. You don't have to have it, but I think it makes it a bit more easy to look at for you. And then I'll say cost. I can also, if I want to make sure I don't misspell, I can also find that one over here. But then I just need to delete these two percentage signs. So this is my calculation. Then I want to say, where do I want to write it? It will be in the cell. And that will be in the column D. That's one before our column E before. That's where our profit goes. And the row, that will still be in the Excel row counter. Click this X here. Excel row counter. Save. So now we have our workflow. I'll save it again. And then we will try to run it. So here uh, we are launching Excel, we're reading from it and iterating. So we can see it takes a few seconds uh, more. 
and let's just go to our Excel sheet. That's it. That's how easy it is to process rows in Excel. I also told you that we often uh, get some errors when we automate in Excel. That's because OneDrive, Power Automate for Desktop and Excel doesn't really talk that well, talk that well together. It's not a problem. You'll usually get a fail to open Excel document or a file related error. Let's force the error and then let me show you how to solve it. Uh, don't worry, it's very easy. So if I go up uh, in the first, uh, this right to Excel worksheet, here I say revenue minus cost, and then I just say minus a text value. So this one will give us an error. And um, the thing is, uh, now we can force the Excel error. So what will happen? We are launching Excel. This will uh, give us an error here. The workflow will stop and then we are not closing it properly. That means that it locks the Excel sheet. Let me show you. So if I just click play here, we're launching Excel and there you go. We have an error. And um, if I try to run it again, um, I can show you both. I can, uh, if I open it, you, you'll see that I'm getting these uh, kinds of errors. I can't really open it. And when I run it again, we will fail up in the launch Excel where we will get a timeout error uh, that we can retrieve, uh, that we can open this Excel instance. So let me just fast forward till it fails. And you can see that it actually just uh, keeps running. This will give us an error eventually and uh, we don't have to wait for that. So I'll click stop here. So now we want to say, I want to fix this. And this is actually very easy. Um, so what I will do is just, I have my Excel sheet here. So I'll go down to the start menu. Here I will just start typing CMD. That will give us a the command prompt. So we'll open this. So now we want to close Excel by force. And remember, if you have any Excel sheets open on your computer, this will also close them. So remember to save them because uh, they it will not prompt you. So what we are going to write here is task kill forward slash F that is force. And then we want to say the image of Excel X. So when I run this command, I just press enter. You can see that we now shut down two processes. We also need to go into data. Now this is unlocked and click close here and then we can click save. So now, um, and uh, just for good manner, uh, press the upper arrow in here and just do this again. It's not found now, but sometimes it opens up again. So now we can run it and we have freed, uh, so to say, our Excel uh, sheet. And here you can see we still have the arrow. So we should, of course, uh, fix that one. And we can do that by saying this. And now we will get the error again. So let's just uh, counter that by doing show here. Click close here. We repeat it. It's uh, nice to see. So then we do this. Now you can see we have the process has been terminated. So uh, again, whenever you went in and did it, click close in the document recovery, remember to do the task skill. Now the process will run perfectly. So that's it. Is this video helping you? Then you can really help the channel and me by giving it a thumbs up. Thank you. Now we will look at how to automate applications in a broader sense. We will use a simple application, which is the calculator. But the same principles apply in automating all applications. So we want to automate Notepad. It's the same principle that goes whether you automate Notepad or more advanced applications. So Notepad is a good sample application. The first one is that we'll need to find the path of the Notepad. So I'll go down to start and this is a good way to find path of the applications that we want to automate. I'll need to use Notepad. So I right click, then I say open file location and let me just drag it in here. Here we can see this is a shortcut. So again, I right click, open file location, here it is. So I'll need this path because I now I want to open up Notepad. So here I can shift with your keyboard, right click with your mouse, and then find a copy as path, move back to Power Automate Desktop. So the first thing we will do is that we will open up this um, notepad in 
here. So we will find a run application and that one. Is. So here we will paste in the path. Remember to move the quotation marks. This will actually have worked if we just had did this done this, but uh, for stability and because we'll use that with a lot of uh, applications, the full path, we will just type in the full path because you might not know that with some of the apps, we can only use the endings. So always just use the full app. This will produce a variable called app process ID. I click save. Now, when I run this application, this will open up a notepad. So far, so good. So here we want to fill something in. There's just some text that could be uh, every application that we are filling something in. This is an input field, just like, you know, input fields in SAP, ServiceNow or whatever you use. So go up here and then find a populate text field in window. Take the one under form filling. So I'll drag it in here. Here we need to have a UI element that is a text box. So we're Click that drop down, say add UI element. Here you can see that in the app, I can now choose different parts of the app. That is all elements that we can fill text into. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense to fill text in here, but it is possible. We want the input field down here. So I press control on your keyboard. I repeat, control on your keyboard, left click with your mouse. We have now created a UI element. Now we just need to fill a text in and I want to say if this video helps you, please help me and give it a thumbs up. Thank you. So now we have created a working flow. Why don't we try to run it? So it will take a few seconds and then we'll type in uh, the text. There you go. You have now created your first automation in applications. Well done. We also want to make it bold text and here I want to click format and then click font and so forth. So go up in actions and this is just like clicking buttons in any applications. We'll find a click UI element in window and drag it in. Here we have a UI element. So again, we click this little drop down, take the add UI element. Let me just move it over here. So I find the format that is the first button that I want to click. Press control on my keyboard, click the format. So now we're doing two things. One thing I want to show you is click the stack of paper over here to the right. That is UI elements. Here you can actually see that we have created some elements and we have different windows. So windows or actually the computer is the top level. Then we have a window and here you can see we have a little asterisk and that is because when we write in a notepad, this little asterisk uh, comes up, it means that um, it's unsaved. So that's why we have two different windows. Here we have the document text editor and best practice is to rename your UI elements. So either right click or F2, click rename. So here I want to say notepad input field. And down here I can say uh, rename I can see a format button, make something it do something meaningful. So it's easy to maintain both for you and for future developers. So not any practical difference, but for um, for future use, you will be happy just to make it a habit. So now I can click the format button. Let me try to run it again. Here we fill in uh, the text in a few seconds. There you go. And we click the button. So um, that's it. And you can see here it actually it um, because we have we had two uh, notepads open, it uh, got a little bit confused and took the other one and clicked the format in the last one. That's why it's always good practice to close down all open applications when you begin an automation. In that way, uh, our automation will not get confused. So uh, everything works, but uh, we just need to uh, close down a notepad here at the beginning. And for that, I can find a terminate a process and drag it in in the, in, in the start, sorry. So I'll find it up here. And here I'll have a process name. So what I can do here is just click this little drop down, and either type it in, I'm lazy, so I'll do that. Or we could write it. Since we don't have any notepad open, let me just click save here and open up a notepad. You need to have the application open. 
So uh, I created this little trap. And I didn't, I just forgot that I should have uh, opened uh, the last one. So I like these videos because you'll see how I work. And now we can find a notepad. It's probably also the same mistake as you can make. And I think you can learn a lot for them. So from them. So then I can click notepad. I click save. So now we terminate the notepad process first. And let me just open one more so uh, we can see that it works. So now I run the automation. I terminate the process that will uh, that closed to two of them. And now we only have this one open. So now we are clicking the format that one worked. Now we just need to click the font and get into the font options. So we go up here and then we'll have a click uh, another click UI element in window. Again, we will create the button So click the drop down add UI element. And now you need to don't click control now. So click the format. Then when you're here, click control, press font. Go back here, click save. Again, uh, I want you to go over to the UI elements. Here it says menu, menu item format, blah, blah, blah. Here, I really just want to say font button. You can see it makes it a little bit more easy to read. So now we need another click UI element because when we clicked format font, this pop up will open. I need to click bold and then click OK. So uh, another click UI element, you know the drill. And this is the exact way you automate applications. It's straight forward, no magic here. Click this drop down, add UI element, find the bold here, press control, and we have created another one. Then I can click save. Here it says list item bold. That might be fine. It's actually a list and it's called bold. Then we want the last one in here and we want to uh, add another UI element and click OK. So here I press, press Control and recreated that one. Click Save. I think I just want to use the syntax that I used before. So OK button. Now, um, we can just actually have this one open because uh, we're terminating it up here. So let us try to run it. So we're terminating it, opening up a new instance. And again, the benefit of doing this is that we can always make sure that we start up a fresh instance where we have our rules in. And there you go. We have automated Notepad. So uh, since this one will stay, let's just uh, make it back to regular. When we want to close it, we could, of course, have this file exit and then choose if we wanted to save and so forth. You can do that. That is just more click UI elements. That is a good approach if we want to save it. Here, we don't have anything that we want to use. So let's just copy this one here, go down to the button and paste it in. We will terminate it again. Uh, we will like to see that it actually works. So I find a wait, drag it in, and let's just wait for four seconds. I click save. I only do this so you can see what's going on and not, not for any practical use. So I just started. Now um, we are filling in the text again. We are formatting in the text. So uh, now you actually learned how to automate applications. And we wait four seconds and terminate it. What do you think about Power Automate Desktop and this course? Please let me know in the comments below. Now on to automate browsers and do a login. I have a web page here which you can find by navigating to the internet.herokuapp.com forward slash login. Here I need to do a login with Power Automate Desktop. That's it. Fill a username build a password and a login. And hint, hint, the username is actually up here since this is only a test page. The password is here. Copy that one in here. Click login. And now our task is to take a screenshot of this area. Wait three seconds. Click login. I hope you understood it because we will create it together now. I just refresh it to get rid of this green bar. To open up a browser and to navigate to a URL, we of course need the URL. So I go up here and copy in the URL. Back to Power Automate Desktop. I'll find a launch new. And here you can see I can pick Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, or Edge. As long as you don't choose Internet Explorer, as that one is outdated and insecure, 
I'm fine with whatever browser you choose. And each one of them will be very easy to automate. So I'll launch a new instance. The initial URL, press Control V, that is my URL from before. Here you can see we produce one variable that is a browser variable. So this is a browser instance that we created. And when we want to automate in this window, we just refer to this variable. I click save. Try to click run and see that you can actually open up the browser and navigate to the page. This one works for us. Now we need to fill in the username and let's just copy the username from up here. We will store the username in a variable. So I'll find a set variable and drag it in above the launch new Chrome. In variable here, I will call this username. And the value we'll give it is control V, that will be Tom Smith. Now I can refer to the username variable. And whenever uh, I do that, I'll get the value Tom Smith back. I click save. Now let's try to use it. So I'll find a populate text field on web page under web form filling, drag it in after launch new Chrome. Here you can see that we are referring to the browser instance that we just created, we talked about. The UI element, that is anywhere on a web page we have UI elements. And if I click this drop down, I can click add UI element. And here you can see we can add different UI elements from this web page. And actually, uh, this is what the web developers made. And I will choose the input text here. Now press control on your keyboard left click with your mouse and we have created our first UI element, which is the input username field. In here in text, we could write Tom Smith like this, that one will fill in Tom Smith, but we created a variable for that. A variable needs to have percentage sign in the start and in the end, we don't have to write it. Just click this little X here. And here you can see our username variable, either click it and click select or simply just double click, which I prefer. And we can click save. So now we have our first flow. Let's test that it actually works. So we open up a browser, fill in a username. It's that easy to automate web. And let me go back to the, uh, to the Power Automate desktop. If I go over here to the right, click UI elements. You can see that we have created a UI element here called input text username. That is the input field. First, I like to rename my variables, so I can either click right click and click rename or press F2. I'll call this username input field, just to have a little bit more describing a name. You can see that it automatically gets updated the name over here. Down here is a picture, and if I double click it, here you can see our selector. The selector is built up from these elements. We will not go through them in this session, but it's worth to mention that we uh, this selector is the CSS selector. It says, look in the input element, find the attribute ID with the value username. Let me show you where this is from because this is valuable. This is a little bit more advanced, but I'm sure you will like it. In a browser, you can press F12. That will open up the developer tools. I want to inspect the code for the username field. So if I click this little arrow when I'm in the elements, click it here, and there you go. The input, that was the input element. If you move a little bit in into that element, you can see the attribute ID equals username. So this is actually just the code that we used. We could have typed it in ourselves if we wanted to do it, but Power Automate Desktop do it automatically. So uh, that's how easy it is. Let me close it again. Click cancel here. Now you know where these selectors originate from. We also need to fill in the password. So let's go copy that. Let's find a set variable like this and drag it in here. This one I will call password. Control V the value in super secret password. I can click save. Similarly, we will populate text field on web page. So I'll find a populate text field on web page. Take the one on the web form filling and not the one on the form filling. So I'll drag it in here. The UI element, that is the password field. So I click add UI element and find the password field just as we did before. Now click control on your keyboard and left click with your mouse. 
we have created another UI element. And again, the same syntax, click this little X here in the text, double click the password. Now we can fill the password in. I click save. Go over to the UI elements again. In case you don't see them, it looks like this. You can just click them. Go down here and now I'll try to click F2. That will also rename it. This one is called password input field like this. Now, again, let's try to run the robot to see everything works. We usually do that. We do it step by step. So we can see that we have typed in the password and it's very likely that it's the password that we set up here. Now we need to click a button. So up in actions again, then you'll find a click link on web page. And that one is here. Drag it in after the two populate because now we have filled in username, password, we need to click. Again, we end the browser the instance and we want to add another UI element. So click the drop down, add UI element, go find, find the button here. You can see we have both a text and a button. Both will probably work. I prefer the button, but I think both will work. So just take that one, press control, left click with your mouse. We have created another UI element. Again, I click save. And now always go over to the UI elements, make it a best practice to always rename these UI elements that will make it easier to maintain both for you and your colleagues. So in the button radius, I right click, rename and here I will say login button, I click enter. Now we can try to run the robot again to see that we can now uh, fill in the username password and click the login. That's it. We are now logged in. This one up here is just my password manager. So don't worry. Now we need to take a screenshot, wait three seconds and click log out. So uh, we will do the take screenshot first. So let's find a take screenshot of web page. We can also do of UI elements, but for now we will do the entire web page. Drag it in here. So here I can say, do I want to take the entire web page or a specific element? I'll just take the entire page. Save it to a clipboard or a file. Here I need to uh, have a file. I want to uh, save it to my desktop. A good little pro trick. Let me, let me click save. That will give me an error. So I go to my desktop. I right click. Then I say new and a new text document. This will easily get me the path of my desktop instead of I have to write it and um, uh, make errors. So I shift right click copy as path, go back to power to make desktop. Now I open up the text screenshot of web page again. I could also click this little file selector, but I prefer the other way. So here the image file now say control V. I know this is a text document, we'll fix it. So I'll do this, delete the two quotation marks. And then let's talk about what file format we want to use. We want, for example, a PNG that is the most often used. So I'll take that one. Then we'll also need to have a PNG ending up here. So instead of TXT, we'll have a PNG. Now let's give it another name. So I'll say maybe new screenshot. Nothing fancy, but this will work. So now we take a screenshot of the web page, place it on the desktop. We will wait three seconds and then we'll click the lock out button, which you'll find here. So find a wait here. Drag this wait in. Here you just need to specify how many seconds you want to wait for. I'll wait for three. The reason I do this, this is just a process description, but it's actually so we can see that we are uh, clicking log out. So that's the only one for this. And you will learn to make these delays. We'll often also make delays in web development in Power Automate Desktop when we want to load things probably. So now we want another click link on web page here. Drag it in, let me just drag it in in the end. So we need to create another UI element for that. So add UI element, take uh, the logout here, press control, pick it, and click save. Again, you know the drill, go over to UI elements, and here you can see we are on a different page. So these ones got created up here from the login page. This is the secure area, so we created it down here. Right click rename and then you say lock out button like this, click enter. 
So now we have created our entire flow. Shouldn't we try test it? So here I'll click run. Login, do a screenshot, wait three seconds and then do the logout. That worked. Uh, we just need to check for the screenshot. There it is. It's that easy to automate browsers. As Power Automate desktop developers, we work a lot with files and here's how to do it. I have created a folder with six files in it and the mission now is to sort each file type and then create a new folder and cut them into there. So that means that each text file will go into a directory called txt and so forth. I also build in a trap that you'll see a lot in the real world. That is the extension here is in capital letters and this one is non capital letters. But of course, each text file must go into the same folder. My name is Anna Jensen. Let's learn some Microsoft Power Automate desktop. If you want these sample files, you can go to the link in the description below, mark them and then click download. I downloaded mine to my desktop. You'll we'll see them here. That's uh, the directory. I want to grab the path of this folder. So what I do here is that I press shift and then right click with my mouse. That will open up this extended menu. Go find the copy as path and we'll go to Power Automate Desktop and create the solution. First, we will set a variable for the folder path. So choose a set variable and drag it in. We will name our variable file path then in the value control V to paste it in. So I'll delete the quotation marks and then I'll click save. Now we can use this variable name whenever we want to call the path. This has the benefit that if these files get moved, we can just change it here in the set variable. Now I want to get the files that is in this folder. So I'll find a get files in folder and drag it in. So here the folder, that is the folder path that we just created up here called file path. So I'll click this little X here and choose the file path. We will not choose to include subfolders, but we can do so if we want it. The variables produced, that is called a files and that will be a list of files. But then I can click save. Let's try to run the automation to see that it works, that we can add the files to a list. If you go over here on the right and click this little X, if you don't see the variables in files, double click it. Now we have a list of files. Each item has its, uh, its place on the list. We have three items and the first one is index zero, then one and two. That is because this is zero indexed. If I click the first one, I can click more here. You can see, and let me just expand it. We have some properties of this file. For example, we have the extension and that is called dot extension. And here you can see the extension of this last, this first one here that is called dot X L S X. And um, this is the Excel file. And if I just go back here, you can see all six ones here. I can again, I can just do this to show all the elements. Now we will work with that extension to determine what type of file it is. And then we will do the sorting. So I'll click close here. The first one we'll do is to iterate to each file. So I'll find a for each. A for each loop iterates a collection from start to finish and the value to iterate. That will be my list of files. You'll find it up here. So I'll click this X and double click the files. I will then store the current item uh, into a variable called current item. But since we uh, each item is a file, let's just rename it to file. It doesn't mean anything, but this is just a reference variable that says when we work with the first one, we can call file that will get us the first one. The second one we can uh, reference to file again and grab that one. So just for referencing, it makes your flows a lot easier if you rename your variables to names that is describing for what they're doing. So for now, let's just try to write out the extension. So find a display message. And we drag that one in. So in the for each down in message to display, click this little X here, click the arrow to the left of the file, and we'll find the extension, which is here and double click it. Now our expression is file dot extension inside percentage sign. 
Let's see that it works. So I'll run it. Here you'll see .xlsx, .xlsx in capital letters, and so forth. Let us just stop it. Now we know that it works. We need to do a little bit of text manipulation. First, we will remove the dot, and the dot is always in its first place. So we will just remove the first character for, for, from this value. So what I'll do here is that I'll find a get subtext here and drag it in in the start of the for each. The original text, well, that is the file dot extension. So here again, I'll just do the file. I always prefer to find them here in the menus. I could write them, I could just write this, but we will reduce the risk of errors when we just choose them um, automatically. I want to start at a position. And in programming, it's zero index. So the first uh, position, that is position zero, then the second position is position one. That means that we will start at position one. And the length, that will just be to the end of text. And the variables produced, that is a subtext. But here I'll say extension value. This is just the name of the variable and I'll click save. Now we can write this extension value out in our display message. So simply just delete it, click this little X here and double click the extension value. Then I can click save. So now we have removed the dot and we can see it when we run it here. We have removed the dot. That's the first part of our mission. Let's stop it. Because we also want to make uh, every uh, extension to lower so we can compare them better because uh, there's no difference for us whether or not it's capital or not, but else there will be. And we will click this little X here and then say change text case and drag it in right after this get subtext. The text to convert. Well, that will be the extension value. So I'll find it up here. I will convert them to lowercase. So pick that one here. And the variables produced, let's just save the value to the extension value again. Click this X, choose the extension value, and click Save. So now we have removed the dot, and we have converted to lowercase. XLSX, XLSX, DOCX, and so forth. There's no difference in the capital or non-capital now. We can start comparing them and moving to new folders. We will first count them because we also need to create a nice log. And let me introduce you to a custom object. A custom object can be seen as a dictionary where you add key value pairs in. So I'll find a set variable. We will initialize it in the beginning. I'll drag in the set variable up here and then we'll give it a proper name. I'll say file count like this, and then we'll give it a value. So the syntax is we want percentage signs in start and in the end. Then we want curly bracket in the start and the end, and then we can add the key value pairs. For example, we can say uh, test A in single quotation marks, then a colon, and we can say this one has a value of result A like this. And uh, so this is a key value pair. The name is test A and the value is result A. Then it's comma separated, so it looks like this. We can add a space that doesn't matter. It will be treated the same. Now let me just add one more item. So I'll say test B in colon that equals to result B. This is just to show you how this nice custom object works. That will be useful to you. Let me have a display message. It's just to write out something. So if I want to say, I want to look up test A or test B, I can go into the X here. So I go into the file count, that is this custom object up here. And then after the T, hard brackets, then single quotation marks. And inside that, I can say test B. So I look up a name and then I'll get a value back and click save. Now let me try to run it. Here you can see, we look up the test B and then we get the value result B back. That's how it works. We will use it for the file counting. That means that we will have each extension in this list. That means that XLSX will be one item and then we will have the count of the files. The DOCX will be another item and then we'll have the count. 
we will only add it once. That means that we should check if this extension exists in this file count. It will not for the first item. So then we will just add it to it and we will give it the value one because now we know we have one file type. If it exists, we will just add one to it. It looks like this. So, and I really want you to do this because this is so nice to be able to do. It will help you in a lot of your workflows. I'll stop. Let's also delete this display message. So I'll delete it again. I go in here because this will be an empty list. We will of course not have test A, test B. That was just to show you. So I delete everything. And to make an empty one, we will have two curly brackets in the start. And in the end, like this, I'll click save. It looks like this. So now we want to say, does our file extension, that is our file type, does that exist in this file count? If yes, um, we will just add one to it. If no, we will create it. So when we ask questions, we'll use an if. Search for an if. Drag it down below the change text case. And then you will ask. And I'll go here. So we want to ask is if does the file count contains, I'll click this X, file count. And then we want to say, does that one contains? And we'll say, does it contains the extension value here? Yeah. And that means, does it contains XLSX, uh, DOXX, and so forth? And we will click save. We will not use this ignore case. We could have used it and then got rid of where we changed the text case. But since we're also going to use this extension in a lock, we have created the solution with this one here. So then I can click save. So now we have an if. And if this is true, we do something. We also want to add a branch to whenever this expression is not true anymore. That means that the item is not created up here. So I'll find an else and drag it in. Right now we have nothing in it. But if it doesn't exist, we want to create a value up here, the key up here and give it the value one. So let me find a set variable and drag it in inside the else. So right here, I will say, um, I want to set the file count. Go here. I want to say, give me the file count, but the key I'll put in inside of hard brackets. If I just wanted to do a test uh, B, test C, I'll have it in single quotation marks. But because our value is right here in the extension value, I'll use that in here. So delete this text C and I'll just say extension value. So uh, because we are inside these percentage sign, that means that any text here without single quotation marks will get treated, uh, treated as a variable. So we're going into the file count. We add uh, this key, the extension value. Now we just need to give it um, a value. And um, since it doesn't exist before we're creating this, we're down here in the else, we will just give it the value one. It's the first time we see this file type. Then I can click save. So I can run and expect, inspect. We don't really do nothing. And right now we could have deleted this display message because now I'm sitting here and clicking this one six times. It's okay. I'll just delete it afterwards. That's not uh, really a big issue. But now go over to your file count and click here. So now you can see we have one XLSX, one DOXX and one TXT. That is because we're only creating the item the first time we see it. We don't do nothing if it's exist. But now this part of the solution actually works. So I click closed. Let's delete the display message down here. And uh, we solve for the then branch. We'll just do the same as here. So we can either drag in another set variable or simply just copy this. I recommend copying it because we are lazy as automation developers. So I control C, go up to the else, control V. We need to modify this a bit. So if I go in here, I'll say it's still uh, the file count extension value, but now I want to add one because I know it's there. I'll ch check for that in the if, so I'll add one to it. And that means that I'll grab this expression, remember the percentage sign. So I copy this one here and put it in here. To add one to it, just move inside the percentage sign and say plus one. This will add one to it. Now I can click save. Try to run the automation again. Now we have created a solution that creates a nice lock. 
we still need to create folders and uh, move the files. But if you go over here, that's it. And this solution is so great because it works with any file type. You can try other file types. This will work. So then I can click this X. So now we know uh, we, we need to create a folder if we haven't created one. That means that the first time we see the file type, we'll create a folder. And again, we are down here in the else. So click this little X here and then find a, a create folder. It is here. Put it in the else branch. It doesn't really matter uh, if you put it uh, on top or in the end of the else. So we create a new folder into and then it will be the file path. That is the directory of our files. The new folder name, that will just be the extension value. That could be xlsx, doxx, and so forth. So refer to the extension value like this. Then we can click Save. So now we have created a folder. And we know the folder exists if we are up here, because then otherwise we would have created it previously. So now we can start to move the files. So we will go after the if down here, and then we'll find a move file. Yes. Yeah, and drag that one in here. So the files to move and now that's just time to do a referencing, we are referring to the file up here. So click this X and this is the file. That is because that is where we iterate each one of our files. Where do I want to move it? Well, I want to move it into the file path. File path. That one is up here. So that is our main folder. But I also want to create the subfolder. Otherwise, it will just move it to the same folder. So I'll have it backwards slash. And then I will move it to the extension value. Like this. So now um, we have created a solution. If the file exists, well, it would only exist if these folders were already present, and then we would have to create a dynamic solution. Here I recommend using a date time, but this is not the scope of this exercise. If you want to know, you're more than welcome to ask uh, down here in the description. I can link you to my solution. Then we can click save. So now we are moving the files. Let's also create a log when we are done. Here I'll just write out this file count. It's not the most fancy log, but again, uh, it's a log. And we can in later um, lessons, we can see how to create even more nice logs. So here it will just be a display message, but it could also be to a text document. Go down here and then just write out the file count like this. Then we click save. So now again, let me repeat what we actually have accomplished here because it's quite huge. We're iterating through each files. Then we'll uh, count them. We're also saying that we treat um, these ones here in non-capital and capital endings equal. And then we'll start creating a folder and moving them. Let's see how it goes. And I can open this so you can see the solution. And you can see the folders are getting created and the files are getting moved. And this is our lock. Again, we could uh, format it, but it is a lock. It is a working lock. Then I can click OK. Here, the word file is in here. The text file is here, the Excel file is here. Automating emails is as easy as everything else in this video. And here's how to do it. I want to send dynamic emails, that is specific content to a specific recipient. So here I have four students. It could be an Excel sheet with 100 students. But for now, this is a fine example. I have four columns, name, email, homework and deadline. Their name is here. I want to have that filled in. They have separate email addresses. Because I don't want to spam anyone or myself, I just use this 10 minute email. You can fill in your email or your 10 minute email here in this column. This Excel sheet can be downloaded in the video description. So you can change it here. Their homework, uh, you can see Anna needs to learn Power Automate, Becky needs Power Automate Desktop, Carly needs power automate that here we have a space and Dora needs UI path. But don't worry too much about this. This is just to show that we can fill in dynamic content in these emails. They also have a, a separate deadline. So I want them to be filled in properly. Let's show how it works. And this 10 minute email, we can just refresh the page and then get 10 more minutes or click 10 more minutes here. And that is the one that we use here. 
So in Power Automate Desktop, let's first read this Excel sheet. So let me close it. I downloaded mine to my desktop. You can do the same. So shift right click like this, copy as path. We will use that path. The first we'll do is to set a variable with that path in. We'll drag it in. So here I'll call my variable Excel path like this and just control V, paste it in. Delete the quotation marks and click save. So now I want to launch Excel. So here I'll say launch and I'll drag in an Excel. I will not open up a blank document, but I'll open the following document. Now I could type in the path or find it by clicking here, or we have created a variable for it. This is actually best practice because we want to make sure that if this path, path changes, we can uh, update it quickly and imagine that we use this path a lot in our flow. This will be convenient. I will not have the Excel instance visible and I will click save like that. So now I also want to read the data from the Excel sheet. So I'll find an, a read from Excel worksheet and drag it in. I want to retrieve everything uh, that is in the worksheet. And in the advanced, I'll say first line of range contains column names. I'll take that one. In. The variables produced that will be Excel data. So then I can click save. You'll also need a close Excel. So I'll close my Excel. That one is here. That will just close the Excel instance and do not save it. It's fine. So we created, we read our data. Now we can start to send our emails, but let's just see that this works, that we can launch Excel, read the data, close it again. And this is just to show that our data is over here. There you go. So name, email, homework, deadline. If we wanted to make it a little bit more stable, say that we have two sheets in this Excel sheet. I know this is not an Excel lesson, but best practice is to always activate the correct sheet. And here, um, let me open it again. Imagine that we have this one as last active. Then we will start reading here. We could not use these data. So we want to make sure we are unconscious. Right click, rename, control C, close it down again. Then in Power Automate Desktop, I'll just, just find a quick activate worksheet. So active, wait, uh, set active Excel worksheet. You can see um, there's a lot of actions to fill in. So set active Excel worksheet. And then right before the read, I'll just paste in the worksheet name and click save. I will not show you that this works, but trust me, or you can just try to run the robot, pause the video and do it. So now we need to launch the Outlook. I'll find a launch Outlook instance. And this is necessary to have an Outlook account on your computer. So yeah, I'll launch the Outlook instance like that. And now I want to say, I want to iterate to each one of the rows in our data. This data table over here, the Excel data got re read into this data table. And I want to take them one by one and then process them. So what I want to do is first take the for each like this and drag it in here. The value to iterate, that is the Excel data. Click this X, double click the Excel data. Here you can see that we refer to the current item that is the row that we have as current item. I want to refer to it as student. So I click save. So now we're iterating to each one of the rows one by one. Since we need to send separate emails, that's, that's why we do it like this. So in Outlook, find a send email message to Outlook and drag it in. The account, that is the account, the data file that you use in Outlook, minus call this. Who do we want to send it to? And now it gets uh, not tricky, but uh, we just need to know what we do. Since we refer to each row as student, I want to say to. Take this X here and then go find the student and double click it. Now I just need to say what column do I want to fill in? This is the email column. In case you forgot, you can always open the Excel sheet and inspect. So here I'll have a hard bracket, single quotation marks, and then I'll say not student, but email, single quotation mark, and a hard bracket more. I also want to have a subject and here I'll just say remember to do your homework. 
and then I can fill in the body. I can also add attachments and everything more, but for now, this simple exercise will do. So here I'll say, hey, and then I want the student's name. Click this X here again, you know the drill, say student. Inside here, hard bracket, single quotation mark, and then I'll just say name, single quotation mark, hard bracket, end. So, and then I'll say, remember to do your, and again, um, I need to say, what kind of homework do this student want to do? So I click here, take the student, go in here, and then pick the column in the Excel sheet that I want to use. So I'll just make two hard brackets, two single quotation marks at once. And I'll say homework. So this is saying, go to the current row, homework column, and use what's there. So I'll say, make your this kind of homework, homework, no later than. We also want to get the deadline, that is the deadline column. And again, I'll just find a student, go in here, do this, hard bracket, single quotation marks, and then say deadline. And again, this is the Excel column names. So this is not uh, standardized um, references. This is just what I chose to call it in, um, uh, in Excel. Now I can add a signature. Let me just copy the one from my email, where I say kind regards on the Jensen, and then my social media links. So now I can click save. We have everything we need, and we even have our 10 minute email here. Let me just get 10 more minutes just for, um, just for simplicity. So now we have 10, we have an empty inbox. Let's see if it works. Again, if you want to send it to another place than 10 minute email, feel free to change the emails in the Excel sheet. Now let's just inspect that we can actually send dynamic content. So we're launching Outlook, iterating through it, and let's go to our 10 minute email. We have four emails, you can see them down here. Let's pick the first one. Hey Anna, remember to do your power automate homework no later than and then we have 1 30 2023 at 12 a.m. Since we didn't specify um, a time, this is how it looks. We can easily work with date and times in Power Automate for desktop. You can click the video up in here to make sure uh, that you'll understand everything about date and time. But since this is not the lesson, let's just see that we here we have a Becky and with a Power Automate desktop homework, we have Carly and we have Dora. That's it. That's how easy it is to automate sending emails in Power to Make Desktop. When I teach Power to Make Desktop, the most asked question is about web scraping. It's straightforward, and here's how to do it. We need a data set, and here I have some Google searches for my own companies. I want to get the result that is each one of the titles, the descriptions, and the URL behind it. So back in Power Automate for desktop, I need to find a launch and here I can pick my favorite browser. I choose Chrome and drag it in. I can either launch a new browser or simply just attach it to a running instance. I'll choose this one and then we'll make the elegant solution a little bit later in this lesson. Click the drop down here and then find your data. This will produce a variable called browser and I'll click save. Now we can data scrape. So if I go up to actions, I'll find and extract data from web page. Take the one on the web data extraction. This one will open here. So if I open my data set, a new wizard will come up here. That is my scraping wizard. First, I need to pick something from the first element. That is what I want to scrape. That could be the title, but it could literally be anything. Here, I take the title. So I right click here, extract element value and pick the text. Now you can see I got the first title over here in the wizard. Similarly, go down to the second item, pick the title here, right click, extract element value. There you go. We have now extracted all the titles. We can take uh, this description as well. So go to the first item, right click, extract element value and pick the text. That's it. That's how easy it is to do no code web scraping with Power Automate Desktop. The URL is a little bit more difficult to get, so we'll just click finish here. Here I can say, do I want to store it as a variable, which I can use if I want to make a more complicated flow, or do I simply just want to save it to Excel? I will save it to Excel and the variables produced is called Excel instance. I click save here. 
Now I can run. It will take a few seconds and we will open up an Excel sheet with our data. That's how easy it is to web scrape. Now let me show you how to get the URL because that one is not easily accessible. So what we will do here, let me just close this Excel sheet again. To get the URL, I'll need to show you a very cool trick. So add your data, press F12, that will open up the developer tools. This is the HTML code behind this Google site. And if I just click this little arrow, point it to a title, just click it. And here you can see if I move down here, this is the title. It's called something with H3. That was by the way, the same name as we got before with the wizard. And if I move a little bit down, we can see that the text is called Anna Jensen Org, all about automation. So Power Automate Desktop will create an address for us called H3 until to get the text here. If we want to find a URL um, linked to this uh, title, we can move one element back to the A element. You can see here, I have the H3 and up here is the A. This is uh, href Anas Jensen org. So what I can do here is that I can simply just say, um, cut a little bit away from the address that we used before and use this A element. It goes like this. So in Power to Make Desktop, I'll open the extract data from web page again. And if I open up my data, this will open the wizard. We'll move it over here. So what I want to do is to click advanced settings. And here we have the two CSS selectors that we created for each one of the elements. This one up here is for the title. And this one was from the description. Since we want to move uh, to do a little bit of edit with the title, we go up here, press end on your keyboard or simply just scroll away. There you go. You can now see that this was the A element and this was the H3 element. We know that, and let me just find it again. So just to show you, we know that we want to go up in the A element and not in the H3 anymore. So what I can do is simply just copy everything from the A without the arrow and the H3, then go down to specify additional CSS selector and paste it in here. And here we need the attribute href. So I'll say href, and then I'll click OK. Bingo, now we have the URLs. That's how easy it is. So then I click finish, I click save. We can try to run it again. And we are attaching to the browser. There you go. We have now extracted it and now with a URL over here. So we can customize a, our solution a bit more, still with uh, no code. And let's start from an end. We also want to save the data because this just opens an Excel sheet and often you want to save the data. So if I go up here and the easiest thing will just be to find a close Excel and drag it in. So here we are taking the Excel instance that we created up here. I can say before closing Excel, do not save document, save document or save document as we will do that. We will need to create a document path. And the easiest thing to do will be, let me click save here. This one will produce an error. Fine. Minimize and go to your desktop. Let me just minimize this as well. Here I'm just creating an Excel file like this. I'll grab the path of it. And the way to do that is to press shift, right click, copy as path. So now I got a path for this Excel sheet and this will be where I will store my data. I will simply just Delete this one again. It will be created in Power Automate Desktop. Now in Close Excel, go down to Document Path and Control V, paste it in. Now I don't have to write everything here. We could give it a new name. So instead of new Microsoft Excel worksheet, we could call it Google Searches if I could just hit. So Google Searches like it. this. Remember to have the .xlsx on. Then I can click save. So now when I run it, we will also save a closed Excel and save it to our desktop. Here we have the Excel and we have saved it. So if I go down here, there you go. We now have our Google searches on our desktop. 
One thing I want to change more is that I want to give it a unique file name because we really, if we run the robot again, this will get overridden over and over. That's not really nice. So a simple trick is to use the current date and time when the robot runs to make a file name. So I go up here and here I'll find a get current date and time and drag it in up here. This will just produce a variable, a date time variable called current date and time. Save. Now we can convert this date time variable to a text so we can use it in a file name. So find a convert date time to text. The date time to convert. That is the variable that we produced up here called current date and time. Take that one. The format to use, choose custom. And here we will use the .NET custom date time format. It's similar to the one that you know from Excel. So this is the format I want my date to be in as text. So four Y's, that is years, two big M's, that is month, two D's, that is days. Now I want hours in 24 hour format, minutes and seconds. This will be a unique name because the robot will not run every second. So I can use this one here in my file name. And now we have it as formatted date time. So open up the close Excel and use it down here in the result. That will be just before the Google searches. Click this X here and then choose the formatted date time. And maybe we could have an underscore between the formatted date time, the Google searches. So let's uh, see how that works. I'll just click run. We're launching Chrome, extracting the data, and now we save it to a unique Excel book. Look, we now have a unique book. I could run this over and over and it will produce a new file. Pretty clever. We still have to make the elegant solution I promised you in the beginning, because right now we need to have this page open. Instead, let me just grab the URL of the page. If you're scraping another page, take the URL of that page. Now we can close. So in the launch new Chrome, choose launch new instance and paste in the URL. And I can click save. So now I have closed each uh, browser window. I can just click run. The robot will open up a web page, scrape the result and save the data. It's that easy. There you go. And again, we have created a new result. Final thing, this one is dynamic. So I can uh, go in here and I simply just uh, say Microsoft, click save, run the robot, and this will save uh, the Microsoft results instead. Very convenient and we can easily expand our solution. That's it. That's how easy it is to do no code web extraction with Power Automate Desktop. I put together a list of the best Microsoft Power Automate Desktop resources in the video description. At the official Microsoft Power Automate Desktop documentation, you'll find excellently written articles. Do you want to network and solve Power Automate desktop problems with more than 5,000 RPA developers? Then you're invited to the I Love Automation Discord. Here you can get help with the most advanced Power Automate desktop problems and learn to handle job interviews. Since Power Automate desktop and RPA are fast moving technologies, books are quickly outdated. However, there's one book I will recommend you to buy. And that is Clean Code. It's not an RPA book per se, but it's a book about how to write clean code. That is how to apply all the best practices in software development. And since RPA is a sub subset of that, you will want to learn this. The link is also in the description for this. If you want a Microsoft Power Automate desktop job, you want to take the official PL500 certification from Microsoft. I created a guide to pass that. You will find the complete list of all the resources in the video description below. Now you want to apply all the things that you learned. Here's a two hour case that I recommend you to build. 
it will assemble all the techniques that we learned and you can just click the video here to get started.